In this course, we're going to be learning, among other things, how to use uh, polynomials to approximate curves that are not as friendly. Curves like trigonometric functions, or exponential or log functions, or combinations of these. In this example, or in this current image, you can see that this, the line, or the curve, y equals the sine of x, is being approximated by the line y equals x. And the x plus dot 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 indicates that there's an error. As you can see, around x equals zero, there is some, let me see if I can get a pointer to work here, around x equals zero, there is some, some uh, prospective accuracy. And in fact, at x equals zero, the, the value of y equals x is equal to the value of y equals the sine of x. But either side of that uh, x value, there is some error. So as you go out here, you can see there's a, at, at, I don't know, what, what is that, maybe about a 0.25, you can see that there is starting to be some visual error. Now there's, there's error immediately either side of zero, 0. 0.00001, there's error, but you can't see it, you know, unless you zoomed way in here. Um, visually at this scale, the error doesn't seem to occur until about 0. 0.25, either side of, of zero. Um, and, and that's okay if what you're looking for is the approximation of y equals the sine of x near zero. But what if you wanted the approximation of y equals the sine of x at x equals two? The error using a line here, the error is much greater. And so the line is not a good way to approximate y equals the sine of x. That's not terribly surprising. Um, one of the things we can do, however, is that we can increase the power of the function that were the power of the polynomial um, that, we're, that we're willing to use in order to get a better approximation. We've already done some Taylor polynomial work. Back in Calculus 1, we learned how to do linear approximations, and that's exactly what this is here. This is a linear approximation of y equals the sine of x using the line y equals x. It's centered around x equals 0. We could center it elsewhere if we wanted to, but at the moment we're, we're going to center it around x equals 0. And as long as we stay really close to zero, because their values are the same at zero, as long as we stay close to zero, um, we can use y equals x to approximate y equals the sine of x. So if we wanted, for example, y equals the sine of 0 0.001, we could use y equals, uh, y equals x to do that. Now, once we get a little bit farther out, though, um, the error becomes too much for us to be able to call that a good approximation. So one of the things I'd like to notice before we go to the next step here is that the power on x here, the exponent on x here is 1. The highest power in my polynomial is 1. And so we would call this a Taylor polynomial of degree 1, or a first Taylor polynomial. Now, we've only ever called it linear approximation before because we didn't take it any higher than that. So now that we know something else it can be called, um, we're going to we're going to call this a first Taylor polynomial, and then I'm going to tell I'm going to show you what a second or third Taylor polynomial looks like. In fact, because this is the sine of x, it won't let me um, it won't let me show you a second Taylor polynomial because that term would end up being zero. So as I animate this, it's going to jump straight to the third Taylor polynomial, and that looks like that. So now you can see that we have a third power on our uh, a highest power of 3 on our on our independent variable. The x has a, a power of 3. And it's also got a 3, what we, what we would call a 3 factorial in the denominator. I'll talk about that notation in a few minutes. Um, and because it's an x cubed function now, you can see that the, the curve much more closely uh, approximates the curve x cubed curve that I have here now much more closely approximates the sine curve, or at least it approximates it more accurately for a larger region around x equals zero. My visual error only starts at about 1.75, right? I can only start to see the gap between the green and the orange graphs here at about 1.75. So this is a much closer approximation. What happens if we go up to x equals to uh, x to the fifth power? This x to the fifth power. So now I have a fifth degree polynomial that's approximating my sine curve. In this case, notice that the first term is positive, the second is negative, the third is positive, and the next term will be negative, and then positive, and so on. 
this animation will let me go up to 15. And once I'm there, I can argue that not only is the sine of x at 0 equal to this thing at x equals 0, they're both 0, but I can approximate the sine of x using this polynomial for a much broader number of values, for a much bigger range of values. You know, I'm almost all the way from like negative 5 to 5 before, maybe even more, 6, before I can see that there is uh, some, some error. The visual error is apparent beyond 6. Before that, it's not. Now, there is still error in here. At 0 0.001, the Taylor polynomial that I have here does not equal exactly the sine of 0, 0 0.001. Um, but it's so close as to be negligible. You wouldn't be able to tell on a calculator if you, if you plug 0 0.001 in here and you plug 0 0.001 in here. You would not be able to tell the difference. Um, you know, it's, so it's accurate to a much higher degree close to the the value at which we're centered and it's accurate for a much broader range of values so the higher the the value we're uh, able to go up to here um, the more accurately this polynomial describes the curve we're interested in now i haven't shown you how to get these terms i haven't described what these notations mean i haven't told you anything about where this this polynomial comes from yet this part of the video is just to sort of motivate what we're doing. In fact, it, at this point, I'd like to ask you, could you give me two more terms here? Could you make this accurate to the 19th degree? I think you can. Um, even if you don't know what these no numbers mean, you can see what the pattern is here, right? These are both 7s, 9s, 11s, and so on. Um, we alternate positive, negative, positive, negative terms. So you could probably now come up with two more terms here, or even five more terms, that would even more accurately describe y equals the sine of x. Okay, before we go on, I promised I would describe this notation. We say, when we see that, that is an exclamation point, and when we see notation that looks like that, we say 3 factorial. So I'll write that out here. 3 factorial. And all that means, all this notation means, is you start with the 3, and you multiply it by every natural number below. I say natural number because we stop at 1, we don't include 0, um, and you can actually do the computation here, that's just 6. But the reason factorial notation is handy, among, um, among other reasons, is that it lets us say, this is 7 factorial, It lets us describe very large numbers in a small, compact way. This is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And that is equal to 5,040. 11 factorial. You can see how quickly it gets big, right? 11 factorial is... I'm using my calculator because it's a big number. 11 factorial is 11 times 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And that is 399, 16800. So I have 39,900,000. Um, so 11 is not that big a number, but 11 factorial is very large. And this notation lets us use a very small amount of space to describe a very large number. So it's one of the ways in which it's handy. Um, but it also, in the case of uh, things like Taylor polynomials, if I had a term like x to the ninth over 9 factorial, it lets me see that this number here matches this number here. 9 factorial is, oops, I got the wrong thing there, hang on. 9 factorial. This term 
is equal to not x to the ninth over 362,880. And it's not nearly as obvious to me here what the connection is between this 9 and this number down here. Whereas in this form, it's very obvious what that connection is. So um, that's just a quick uh, recap or a quick um, introduction in some cases to factorial notation. And that's all we need to do with that. The next gap I want to fill in here is the difference between what we've been calling the linear approximation. We have a formula for that. We say f of a plus f prime at a times x minus a is the linear approximation of the function f of x around a. So if I had some function f of x, and here's a, and the linear approximation of that function around x equals a is this line right here. And that line has this equation. Notice that this is just the equation mx plus some constant b, right? This is just y equals mx plus b in a slightly different form. So this is the equation of a line where the line's slope comes from taking the derivative of this function, right, because we're looking for this the slope at this point, and that is just the derivative of that function. That gives us the slope of the line tangent at that point. That's all calculus one stuff. We've done all of this before. This linear approximation is stuff we did near the end of calculus one. So this is a linear approximation, but we would also call it a Taylor polynomial. It's a Taylor polynomial of degree one, or a first Taylor polynomial, and so I'm going to give it this notation as well. But it's exactly the same thing. It's a line that we use, or a polynomial of degree one, that we use to approximate a curve near the point A. If we're at the point A, then the value of the function and the value of the line are the same, because that line is a tangent line to the function at the point A. So the values at A are the same, but near A, when x is a little more or a little less than a, we can approximate this curve using this line. And now we know to call this a Taylor polynomial of degree 1 or a first Taylor polynomial. Now, one of the questions we're going to need to be asking ourselves is how big is the potential error given uh, how far away we are from a for that approximation? And in order to do that, I think the, probably the easiest way to do it is just to go ahead and derive it. And that is to notice that the Taylor approximation is an approximation. The actual function f of x, that's my curve right here, that's f of x, is equal to, let me, let me rewrite that. Let's do it as um, the function is, is approximately equal to the Taylor polynomial and if I want to say that it's exactly equal to then I have to say it's exactly equal to the Taylor polynomial plus some error and what I want to do now is figure out how big that error is so let's solve for this error by subtracting everything on the right hand side um, off to the left, except for that value. So I'll have f of x minus f of a minus f prime of a times x minus a is equal to my error, whatever the, the amount of my error is. And we're just going to hold this expression in reserve for the moment. We're going to come back to that. The other thing we're going to look at, though, is this thing called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus has two parts. One is that it, you can take the area under, find the area under the curve, under a curve, by subtracting the value of the function at one point and the value of the function at another point. And the other part says that if you integrate, uh, from b to x, integrate the derivative of the function. Uh, I want to use a different variable here. 
this is a, a dummy variable, t. And when I integrate this, because my uh, one of my values is x, I'll treat that as though it's a constant. When I integrate, I'll be plugging uh, plugging x in, right? Remember that the the, the second uh, first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us tells us that this is just f of x, right? That's what the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, says. But that also says that the area under the curve can be expressed this way. So if that's true, if these both are both true, then these two things must be equal. It also assumes that x is some number greater than b. In other words, b is to the left of x on the number line. Okay, and now I want to do some, uh, on the right hand side here, I want to do some um, integration by parts. So I'm going to let u equal f prime of t. And that means that du is going to equal f double prime of t dt. And I'm going to let v, sorry, dv equal dt. And that means that v is equal to uh, t or t plus a constant or t minus a constant. I'm going to write it as t minus x. t is our independent variable in this case. x is some unknown constant or we're going to treat it like a constant. x is actually a varying number. It's a number that's varying between uh, a and something larger. Um, but we're going to treat it like a constant. And we're going to say that uh, when I differentiate with respect to v, differentiate this with respect to t rather, I just get dt. So now that I have that, I, ha I can rewrite my left hand side using, I'm using integration by parts here. I have a u, down here I'm going to have uv minus the integral of v du. So my u is f prime. My v is t minus x. And from that I'm going to, and that's going to be evaluated between v and x. And then I'm going to subtract the integral from v to x of v du, which is t minus x times f double prime. So I'll write the f double prime first. And then t minus x dt. Let's evaluate this first expression. I'm evaluating the expression f prime of t times t minus x between, between uh, b and x. So I'm going to have f prime of, sorry, f prime of x times x minus x minus f prime of b times b minus x. And then I'll still have this integral. I'll come back to this one. Okay, and note that this is zero. So this whole term is zero. And so that that term will go to zero, and I'll have negative f prime of b times b minus x minus this integral. If I rewrite this as x minus b, that makes that negative. b minus x is the same as negative x minus b. So that makes this first term f prime of b times x minus b, and then I'll still have to subtract that, that integral. Now, I've run out of room, so what I'm going to do is copy some of this over to the next screen, and we'll carry on from there. Okay, this is as far as we got on the previous screen. We have that this way of writing the, the fundamental theorem of calculus is equal to this other way of writing it, or that this result is the same as this one because of the fundamental theorem. Um, we use integration by parts to evaluate this integral. Uh, this was my uv minus integral of v du. And then, uh, let's see, then I evaluated this at x, which gave me a zero, and at b, which gave me this, but it was negative but this was also reversed. This used to be b minus x, now it's x minus b. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to employ that same trick here, actually, um, in the interest of both consistency and moving forward. I'm going to change this to a, an x minus t, and I'm going to change this to a plus. And the reason for that is the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the observation that this first expression is equal to the second one, the second one is equal to the third. The third is equal to the fourth. 
that means the first is equal to the, th the fourth. So that means I can rewrite this as f of b minus f of x equals this right-hand side. And I've done that because the next thing I'm going to do is subtract this quantity from both sides. So that gives me, oh, this should be an f prime too, sorry. Uh, I just evaluated. I don't know what f is, but it's the derivative of f that is the, the function in that position. So I have f of b minus f of x minus f prime of b times x minus b. And that is equal to this integral from b to x of f double prime of x times x minus t dt. And the thing that's interesting here is that this expression here is exactly the same as the one on the previous screen, the one I said we're going to hold this in reserve. And we said on the previous screen that what that was equal to was some error. So now that we have this, we know that our error is equal to some integral that is the second derivative of a function that looks like this. Now, let's take this integral from b to x of this second derivative of a function times x minus t, and let's make an observation about it. If I look at, first of all, notice that I'm differentiating with respect to t, or sorry, integrating with respect to t here. So this is my independent variable. This function f double prime of x is a constant with relation to t. So let's just say for the moment that f double prime of x is less than or equal to some constant m. In other words, m is the biggest number that f double prime could possibly be. If that's the case, then I can rewrite this as this expression here as being less than or equal to the integral from b to x of m times x minus t dt. That's equal to, I'm just going to pull the constant out as we like to do. And I have x minus t. Let me tidy that up. Start to go fast when I, when I get towards the end here x minus t dt, and I don't actually need those parentheses anymore. You'll notice that now what I'm, uh, I'm going to be integrating here is just a function uh, in terms of t, integrating x is x t. In terms of t, uh, integrating in terms of t, I get t squared over 2. And then I'm going to evaluate that between b and x. m is just a constant. When I do my evaluation, I get m times. Now, remember that I integrated with respect to t. That means t is my variable here. x is just some number, right? That's some unknown number. So when I, when I evaluate this at uh, t equals x, I get x squared minus x squared over 2. And when I evaluate it at b, I get um, b, bx, I guess I'll write it that way, bx minus b squared over 2. Now this is, I'm running out of room again. You'll get to know quite quick, quickly that I do that a lot. <laughs> Apologies in advance. All right, so this is now equal to m times, um, how should I write this? Well, x squared minus x squared over 2 is x squared minus 1 half of x squared. So that's 1 half of x squared. I'll just do that as 1 half x squared. And then I have minus bx. And then I have plus 1 half b squared. Plus. If I now factor out that one half, I've divided out a half, right? So I get x squared minus 2bx plus b squared, and that factors to x minus b quantity squared. 
So this is my error. My error is given by this expression. This expression can be thought of as being something less than, this error must be less than, right, this thing here, which I've manipulated until I got to this. So my error, I'll just call it E for now, is less than or equal to m over 2 times x minus b quantity squared, where the m is some amount, some bound, some highest possible value that my second derivative can, can take. So this thing right here, this expression f double prime of x cannot be any bigger than m, so the integral, I'll, go, I'll move down to this version of it, the whole integral can't be any bigger than m times what's left in the expression, and then the rest is just some basic calculus, and I've come up with this expression. So my error is less than this thing for m being some upper bound of the second derivative, and b is the number on which we have centered our study of this particular situation. Oftentimes it's zero. Uh, on the graph that I showed you at the very beginning of this video, we had a polynomial centered at zero, or, or based at zero. Your, t your course pack uses the letter b, and it says b stands for based at. Not sure I feel the need for that, but they're using b as the value at which the whole thing is centered. The, that's the place of tangency for the line if, if in, in fact we're, we're dealing with the first Taylor polynomial. If it's a second Taylor polynomial then we have a quadratic. That's that's a uh, topic for our next discussion, um, but that quadratic would be based at whatever b is, right? It's sometimes it's zero and sometimes it's something else. Anyway, so this is the biggest error that you can possibly have for a function uh, based on a polynomial you're using to, to to estimate it, right? So when you make that estimation, when you find that polynomial, um, the the biggest error you can have depends on how far away you are from the point that you're based at, the center of the graph, and what the uh, second derivative of the function is that you are estimating. 